Western Civ 2, Lecture 14, Totalitarianism. As we think about uh, the 20th century, following World War I, there are many changes that came about. And what we find is that there came to be a new system of government in which a highly centralized authoritarian regime would exert widespread control over people whose individualism would be suppressed for the collective uh, advancement, at least the alleged collective advancement, and uh, active support of those efforts was expected and uh, dissent wasn't going to be acceptable. What we've seen is that in times past there were autocratic uh, rulers, people like Louis the Fourteenth, who uh, thought that they would call the, all the shots, but what's going to happen here is that we're going to see that there's going to be increased intrusion uh, into uh, demanding compliance. Uh, there's going to be uh, something of a uh, denial of transcendent truth that uh, means that people are going to pursue um, a, a particularly an ideologically driven uh, society. Um, a guiding ideology is, is uh, a key element as we think about the uh, development of a uh, totalitarian regime. There's this dream that somehow uh, through accomplishing a certain objective uh, and uh, certain kinds of things in society that you can create a utopia. What's going to come out of this is that typically there's going to be a single mass party uh, and there's not going to be any uh, tolerance of uh, diverse thinking. Dissent will be oppressed, uh, so there'll be no public opposition. Uh, now we've seen that there's been resistance to opposition before uh, in England. As, you know, they, they resisted uh, Catholics after they become Protestant, for example. There's limitations, but this is going to become uh, moved up to a much higher degree. Uh, there's going to be a system of terror to uh, force compliance. Uh, there's going to be a utilization of monopolies over communication uh, as they have new mass communication systems. And uh, there's going to be a uh, central state that plans the economy. So let's go back and see the origins of this new totalitarian centralized authoritarian regimes that emerge uh, with World War One. The origins of this centralized authoritarian regimes type of system is going to come out of a um, the observation with World War One, as we've been seeing governments becoming much much more uh, involved in economy and in, uh, social planning and the like so that they could mobilize people for warfare and uh, this is going to be a, a key element here in the uh, mechanisms that will exist which will bring about this type of authoritarian regime but there's also some things in philosophy in modern philosophy there's increasing doubt and despair and pessimism that's going to come out of world war one Going into World War One, we'd seen that progressivism had been quite optimistic, but coming out of World War One, we're going to find that things are rather pessimistic, and people are going to be willing to make concessions in order to gain peace. Uh, sort of a short-term look, a myopic view, look at things, but um, in modern philosophy, there's increasing uh, despair and uh, a belief that things are irrational and uh, a denial of the existence of God um, and so as a result people are creating uh, their own truth things are becoming much much more relative and um, people are deciding what big thing that they want to chase after and people are going to be convinced by the new uh, mass communication systems of the truth of certain things that may well not be true what we've seen in World War I was that propaganda was uh, very effective in mobilizing people and propaganda will be used through these new outlets uh, 
newspapers will continue on and as radio uh, comes to be embraced it too will be used as an instrument to convey certain sorts of ideas and to move the masses we've moved into more of a mass society and as a result uh, people are oftentimes going to move be moved along by sort of a herd mentality it's what others are doing and uh, not everybody's going to think through the implications of what all they might uh, uh, be presented with along the way. As we think about the origins of totalitarian regimes, we need to look at the economic situation and recognize that in Europe there's about a 50% unemployment rate. Uh, this is something that's gone on for a long time and uh, uh, people are looking for things to change. They're looking for people who provide answers and what we'll find is in the uh, uh, governments where there's political participation in Europe, that there's political parties that emerge, and some of them are going to be holding on to socialist ideas that have been emerging. Others are going to hold on to other ideas of economics. So as we think about uh, the emergence of totalitarian regimes, what we'll find is that there is uh, going to be socialist totalitarian re regimes where the uh, the great ideology, the guiding ideology, is going to be that of Karl Marx as it's adapted by Lenin um, and the focus will be on class struggle in order to accomplish a more utopian sort of society. In Germany we'll see a racist type of totalitarianism emerge where the focus is going to be on racial struggle and uh, the guiding ideology is going to be that you're going to have a uh, master race rule the world and things are going to be better. Some other places will find a sort of nationalist totalitarianism emerge. There are other places where we're going to see that authoritarian governments are going to build their power and authority, and this will take place even in places where there's democracies. What we'd seen before in France was that sometimes people vote away their freedoms, and we'll find that that will take place uh, unknowingly sometimes, unwittingly, by people who want certain benefits from bigger government, but in the process uh, they become less free. So we're going to begin by looking at the totalitarian regime that emerges in Russia. As we go to Russia and we look, we find that there's a revolution that takes place there that we've already talked about as uh, resulting in their departing from World War I. But why would a, a, a revolution take place in Russia? It's one of the most backward parts of Europe. Um, it is a large multi-ethnic empire which has lots of fractures within it. But as we look for long-term uh, causes, we might see a failure to reform as one of those items. Now back in 1861, prior to the Emancipation Proclamation in the United States in 1863, what we find is that uh, Tsar Alex had liberated the serfs. But reforms would get stalled out because Alex the uh, third sorry Alex the, the Alexander the uh, second would be assassinated in 1881 and as a result in reaction to that uh, there's a uh, resistance to bring about change and a, uh, uh, a, a failure to make further reforms Russia is growing in population. What we're going to find is that people are going to uh, gravitate towards some urban centers. Um, economically, though, uh, Russia is still very backward as compared to Europe, places like Germany. And they had fought a very expensive war back in 1904 against the uh, Japanese, where they had been defeated and they'd lost territory. Um, their, their country would, however, be uh, united by the construction of a, uh, a railway system that would go across Siberia. This Siberian railroad system would be important. But um, economically, this war has been very expensive, and they just don't have the resources to build up their country, and the economic system is not in place to build up the country. In the country, there are also... Uh, people who are disgruntled because the nobility, the boyars, control a large amount of the land. Uh, again, there's vast amounts of land, uh, but it's not terribly productive given the uh, 
latitudes in which this land lays. Uh, there are immense natural resources, uh, but the, again, there's just not the, the uh, uh, economic system to uh, have entrepreneurial individuals going and uh, extra extracting uh, those mineral riches, for example, from the ground. So there's long-term problems that exist in Russia uh, where people don't feel like government represents them and uh, they've had ideas that have been brought that way by the uh, the French at an earlier time and uh, amongst the middle class there's not a large middle class but the, amongst the middle class in uh, Russia they were very much influenced by ideas that came from Europe they wanted to see liberalization immediately though what we're going to find is that uh, the Romanovs, the Tsars, had acted with uh, typical autocracy and had uh, not made reforms. And as a result, the immediate causes for the revolution will be World War I. Now, the common people had come to understand that the Tsars weren't for them as a result of events like Bloody Sunday in uh, 1905 when troops fought into protesters that were approaching the Tsar's palace. Um, it turns public opinion against the Tsar in some areas, particularly in the urban areas. In the countryside, there's still some loyalty, but um, there's been a growing unrest with the Tsars, and as they go into World War I, there's going to be such horrible casualties that bring about war weariness. Uh, the the armies aren't prepared to go to war. More men are having to be conscripted and go off to war. The casualties continue to mount and um, people want the bleeding to stop. But the Tsar continues to press the war. The Tsar himself has gone off to lead the battles and this leaves a situation where the Tsarina, the Empress, is uh, back in uh, the uh, capital city and there she's under a great deal of influence by a uh, mystic monk by the name of Rasputin, um, a rather disreputable person who uh, has influence with the Tsarina because he's the only person who seems to be able to um, help the Tsarevich, the crown prince who suffers from hemophilia. This is a condition that had come to be concentrated in some of the royal families in Europe because of the... Uh, uh, the close interrelationships that existed there. So this was a uh, an issue in the uh, Romanov family that had uh, developed. And so he's in danger of bruising with a slight uh, bump and uh, uh, a bleeding death because he, he doesn't have this appropriate clotting factors. And uh, the result is that this mystic monk who comes from a uh, disgusting sect um, is able to stop his bleeding and so he gets uh, the uh, loyal following of the Tsarina who doesn't know too much about economics anyway and as a result he's going to have influence on economic policies that um, are going to uh, cause further harm here for the Romanov dynasty okay so Nicholas II is off at war trying to manage this war with uh, insufficient preparations and uh, in equipment and meanwhile, the economy is continuing to uh, decline. Um, inflation is going wild. And it, with that situation, the population in the urban centers are particularly unhappy. So the economic situation is turning people against the Tsar. He's seen as being impotent. And uh, the, in the uh, military, his officers are killed off. What we're finding is that there's a, a growing rise of uh, soldiers up amongst the ranks uh, who don't necessarily come from the background of nobility. And uh, what we're going to find is they're going to develop uh, local committees of workers and soldiers um, called Soviets. And these groups are going to become increasingly radicalized. A third contributing immediate factor besides the war and the economy is going to be propaganda. We're going to find that uh, radical parties like those uh, advocated by Vladimir Lenin are going to uh, 
uh, use the press, particularly the press Pravda that they establish, uh, to highlight the problems of the uh, czars and the uh, the government that exists. And so, as this press comes to be established, it can't be established under the czar. So there isn't a press until the czars are, are going to be gone. But this is going to be an area where the liberalizing uh, new government is going to uh, leave itself open to problems. Uh, people can use their freedoms to destroy themselves. And here they're going to have freedom of the press. As in March of uh, 1817, sorry, 1917, Tsar uh, Nicholas is going to abdicate. Uh, he wants his brother to take over after him, but his brother is simply going to see that there's no support there, and he too will abdicate, and a bourgeois government, at least the way it's characterized by uh, the Bolsheviks, the, the communists, will take over. Now this is a, a, a government that wants to liberalize in significant ways. Major leaders who are going to lead this uh, new government are going to be uh, Prince Lvov, and a fellow by the name of Kerensky. The kerensky Lvov government will um, take over the Duma. The Duma was a parliament that had existed before, and they're looking to make changes. They're looking to address some of the grievances that existed in society, but they establish a provisional government until a new government can be elected. But the provisional government makes a number of reforms. They, they extend new freedoms, particularly freedom of speech and freedom of the press, uh, freedom of religion. This is going to turn some of the Russian Orthodox against this new provisional government because they think that it's, uh, it's not holding the line and maintaining the uh, powerful position of the Russian Orthodox Church. The Duma will meet. They'll agree to these new freedoms. But in this newly liberated situation, uh, right on the heels of this, the um, the Germans will send Vladimir Lenin in the sealed train with money to establish a printing press which he'll use to take advantage of this new freedom of speech. And he's going to champion his so-called April Theses. So when he gets to Russia he's going to have something of a program that he espouses and um, he's going to call for the Soviets to band together and in his agenda, he primarily wants to get Russia out of the war, but he also wins the uh, the peasants and the countryside as he talks about redistributing land uh, and uh, uh, reorganizing society in ways that they find sounds attractive uh, for workers. You know, they're, they're they're thinking that they are going to benefit. We're going to have a uh, change in society uh, where the privileges here are going to be more equitably distributed. The provisional government has a number of successes, uh, things that people like, but it also has failures. One of the areas where it failed is it failed to make land reform. It doesn't redistribute the land, it doesn't talk about how that's going to take place and any, uh, th anything that's going to happen soon. But perhaps their greatest failure is that they continue the war, a war that they're not in a position to win. Uh, they particularly have a problem as by this point in time the Ottoman Turks have sided with the Germans and this cuts the Russians off from access to the sea uh, and this, this is a, a problem for them. You know, they can't bring in war materials terribly easily. What we'll find is the Allies will try to bring in war materials coming up at, to the port at Archangel up in the Arctic uh, but this is a very difficult uh, area to get to, particularly in the winter time, with all the ice in the Arctic. So, the reform government here, the provisional government, is trying to uh, liberalize, but they're still, because of nationalistic pride, convinced they need to stay in this uh, war, but they don't see any successes. Um, they're continuing to lose terribly. And so this is going to cause uh, public, public opposition and su uh, the support by many uh, for the Bolsheviks. Now the Bolsheviks uh, don't have a uh, majority to take over the Duma, 
but they are going to be able to uh, push forward in phase two of this R Russian Revolution with what's known as the Bolshevik Revolution, led by Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky. Now, Lenin was a fellow who had come out of Russia at an earlier time. His brother had actually been uh, imprisoned uh, because of his radical thoughts, and Lenin himself had suffered exile, uh, and he'd been sent off to, uh, in exile, he'd lived in Switzerland. But there he had written a, uh, a program shrift, a, a plan for what should lie ahead in the document, the pamphlet entitled, What is to be Done? He believed that uh, they couldn't wait for Marx's ideas of a, uh, a political and social development to take place in Russia. What they needed is they needed to uh, just leap over all those things that Marx had predicted and go ahead and have a revolution. Uh, so he's going to be a person who uses writing uh, and also speaking to advance his ideas. And as his speeches get published by newspapers like the Pravda that he'll establish, uh, he's going to uh, sell his ideas to many people as he's going to advocate ending the war, uh, giving power to the people. And as a result, in by the time we get to July of 1917, uh, there's something of a Bolshevik coup that's underway. Leon Trotsky, who plays a role in the Petrograd Soviet, is going to be particularly uh, eloquent in uh, winning people to this cause, and the result will be that they'll seize the Winter Palace uh, there in July of uh, 1917. And in the All-Russian Congress of Soviets that takes place, uh, they're going to eventually then uh, be able to take over. And as they have a coup by which they take over, they depose the Kerensky government. Um, as Once they're in power, then they're going to, by March of 1918, agree to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and uh, get Russia out of the war. Now, this doesn't mean that fighting is going to stop immediately in Russia. This brings on the third phase of their war, uh, and as they try to bring around uh, their new society that they think is going to change the world. So the third phase of the Russian Revolution is a civil war. It's going to go all the way until uh, 1922 when eventually the USSR will be established. But you have to win the peace now <laughs> through war. Uh, the Bolsheviks who flew a red flag uh, were challenged by the white Russians. These are people who uh, look toward the czars, and there are a number of generals that had continued to uh, maintain forces loyal to them, and so we have um, an admiral and a couple of generals in uh, the persons of Kolchak, Denkin, and Udenit, uh, who are going to have loyal troops in the Russian Empire. The white Russians are going to fail in their attempt to retake Russian control. Now, when they oppose the um, the Bolsheviks, they, they do sometimes make some advances, and as they advance towards where uh, the Tsar and his family are being held, um, the Romanov family will be executed in uh, July of uh, 1918, when the revolution is just getting underway. Uh, because there's fear that they might be liberated and uh, might be able to be uh, symbols around whom the uh, the white Russians might coalesce. So Tsar Nicholas and his family are all killed and their bodies are secreted away. An attempt is made to destroy what's left of their bodies. And um, the Russians, the white Russians, are going to continue to fight. Uh, there are members of the royal family that are not of the immediate family, but who could take over. And so they'll continue to fly the old white Russian flag. But as they come to fight, they don't have a unified strategy. Denkin and Kolchak are fighting from the exterior, and they don't communicate well. Furthermore, as they fight, they're going to antagonize the populace. Uh, they do this as they march along with their armies by 
eating the peasants, the, the rural peasants' food, which is going to leave them to starve to death. So there's going to be resistance. Uh, two groups that are marching through, they don't have resources. Instead, they alienate the, uh, the public who might otherwise have supported them uh, by this type of treatment. The white Russians are very nationalistically Russian, and what they're going to do is they're going to fail to mobilize the various minorities which were part of the Russian Empire. They weren't looking to uh, distribute power in the aftermath here, whereby they could give freedoms to the, uh, the various ethnic groups that the Russian Empire had dominated. And so as a result, they're never going to win the support of these ethnic minorities that are within the Russian Empire. Their basic plan was to return to the status quo with an emperor. That was not a terribly attractive proposal. Another problem that they're going to have is that the white Russians gain foreign support. This is going to be used against them by the Bolsheviks. The uh, response of the Russians to the uh, white Russians, this is uh, the sorry, the Bolsheviks, the red Russians to the white Russians, will be that Leon Trotsky and Lenin are going to use uh, their eloquence and their uh, use of publications to mobilize the urban masses uh, to respond to the challenge of what they characterize as a foreign supported opposition. So they're going to use nationalism also as they're going to say that uh, they're foreign powers that are behind the white Russians and so if you're a true Russian you're going to fight with the Bolsheviks. And in their response what we're going to find is that they're going to uh, certainly have a centralized control and command system. Uh, they're going to have the interior lines of communication, whereas, again, the white Russians are fighting around the periphery. Uh, the red Russians are fighting from the center outward. They're certainly committed to their reforms, and they're going to uh, terrorize people who would oppose them using their secret police, the Cheka. Uh, they will institute the universal draft so everybody's going to be called up and if you're an enemy then you're an enemy of the proletariat and uh, we're going to find that both sides are rather radical and uh, impatient with people who might have different ideas but because they're great centralized control and their uh, uh, commitment to this cause and the fact that they're able to get people to buy into this in the name of changes. They're promising changes. Uh, they are not so terribly clear about what all those changes will look like and what all it will cost. People know they're unhappy with what exists and so they're willing to uh, side with change. Uh, some of them are going to get changes they never anticipated. You need to get a clear idea of what change is desired. So the Red Russians are going to be successful by 1922 uh, one of the ways they do this is by offering to uh, ethnic minorities a sense of ownership in this new union of socialist republics. So they'll give these ethnic minorities uh, local freedom and the idea that they're going to be part of this greater collective of uh, proletarians. When the Russians had started out, their thought was that perhaps, again I said Russians, when the Bolsheviks, the socialists, start out here, their thought is that uh, by making peace, uh, what's going to happen is that uh, this revolution that they see starting in Russia is going to pick up uh, in all these areas where you've had this uh, capitalist war going on. The workers of Europe are going to unite against the uh, uh, the status quo that exists there and they're going to change society and we're going to have uh, this dictatorship of the proletariat a worldwide phenomenon what Lenin is going to be willing to do is he's going to abandon world socialism for state socialism uh, there's still the aspiration to expand this to other parts of the world but uh, they're going to embrace Russian nationalism in the process, some of these ethnic minorities are going to be um, marginalized to some extent, but they still see things as getting to be better than they had been under the czars. So, moving to having 
uh, state socialism is one of the steps that um, Lenin is going to make towards consolidating a Bolshevik victory. Another is that he's going to take over the education system. Previously there had been some education which the church had uh, uh, promoted uh, throughout the Roman Empire and no, the Roman the uh, the Romanov's Empire uh, but uh, as he comes to take the reins of power and as the war is being won uh, he's got to win the peace economically uh, there have been millions of people who've been displaced and hundreds of thousands of people who've died in this civil war that's been taking place more than a million people have died and um, so they continue to bleed in Russia and so what he's going to advocate is a change in something that's known as the new economic policy uh, this is part of the characterization that I made earlier of uh, totalitarian regimes as they control the economy and their central planning of the economy. And so land is going to be distributed to workers on communes. Um, but uh, this system hasn't been working too terribly well. And so under this new economic policy, there's going to be some uh, flexibility that's extended where some individuals can uh, do some things for themselves. Now this is going to lead to something of a backlash a little bit later, but um, this first five-year plan is established in uh, 1921, and uh, Stalin is going to embark on this plan whereby they're going to try to modernize Russia and uh, create this worker's paradise. It's by no means a worker's paradise. Uh, there's not enough food uh, around, but under the new plan, if they're able to meet their production quotas, then they're going to be able to uh, feed the populace, and uh, the people in the cities are certainly going to be happier. They're going to be less interested in rebelling against the uh, Bolshevik government. With the control of education and control of the media, uh, they get the picture that things are improving, and uh, the populists get the idea that things are improving, even though they might not see it immediately in their immediate uh, neck of the woods. Stalin will die of a stroke in 1924. He had certainly been the prime uh, figurehead of this revolution. He had been the ideologue, but he had certainly been supported by Trotsky. Trotsky was the uh, eloquent spokesman uh, that is uh, characterized by uh, Orwell in his novel uh, but eventually in Orwell's novel if you're not familiar with Animal Farm he basically characterizes uh, a revolution and he's got Napoleon the Boar who's represented by uh, Stalin and uh, Trotsky is the, the eloquent spokesman pig who helps the revolution happen but eventually is going to be assassinated uh, this, th this is basically drawn from the true life story of what happens to uh, Leon Trotsky. So there's a battle that takes place to succeed Lenin. Various military leaders wanted to take over, but what happens is that the uh, party secretary, a uh, something of a lower level job, was held by Joseph Stalin. Uh, he was sometimes disparagingly known as Comrade Index File. He knew who the members were of the Communist Party. He had their card index. Uh, he, he had the files. And he maintained party membership. And he had a number of people who would come to be beholding to him along the way. So he had never been the eloquent spokesman who had uh, driven things. He'd, he'd sort of been working in the background of the Politburo, this political bureau that's uh, uh, leading the Communist Party uh, that's established by Lenin. So, first of all, you've got people like uh, Trotsky and other generals that have dis differing ideas about how one should proceed. So what Stalin is going to do is he's going to play one party against the other. These are people who are much more prominent than he is, but he plays them off against each other. And uh, there's a number of uh, assassinations that are going to take place. Um, and eventually he's going to come to power. And he, so we're, we're going to move, we're going to move to uh, sort of phase four of the Russian Revolution that's going to go up until 1953, 
with what we might characterize as Stalinization. So following Stalin's ideas here, uh, he's going to be much less uh, willing to make compromises under his economic policies. The farmers who had been given some liberalization to do what they want are now brought strongly under uh, control and on these uh, communes some of the kulaks, as these farmers are known, are going to rebel against that, and they become enemies of the state. Um, and as a result, they're going to be dispossessed of their places on farms and move to work in factories, where they they know how, how to work on farms, and they don't necessarily know how to work on factories, but uh, they're seen to be people who uh, are enemies, and so they're going to be forced to work in the mines, mines which are going to be uh, digging out iron ore that can be turned into steel as he plans to industrialize Russia. This is a major economic plan on his part, is that there's great sacrifices right now, but we need to uh, arm the country for what in, will be inevitably be a uh, capitalist war to try and take over these resources. Uh, they're they're going to fight against us, so we need to be ready for this war, and so Russia has to industrialize so it can build up its uh, its military capacities. Under Stalin, uh, following ideas that had been established by Lenin and ideas that had been held even by uh, Marx at an earlier time, we're going to find that uh, Christianity comes to be seen as a rival ideology. And only one ideology is accepted in a totalitarian regime. So Christianity is viewed as a rival ideology, and it holds to values that are different uh, from uh, Bolshevism. And it holds that people are made in the image of God and precious. Uh, based upon those ideas, there, there had been ideas that there were inalienable rights that people had, and uh, the right that you have is to be in compliance with the state here under the Bolsheviks. And so Christianity is seen as an enemy. So what we're going to find is that the whereas the czars had used Christianity as an instrument of their domination, uh, the idea that there's something beyond this world is opposed to Marx's materialist view. And uh, you know, they want people to be fighting here in the now for the uh, freedom of the proletariat. And that they're, uh, you know, one of the ways that they are going to gain power is that the, the Bolsheviks had promised religious freedom. Uh, that was something that some people had been attracted to. Uh, but by the time we have Lenin in power here, what we're going to find is he's going to implement a number of laws in 1929 regarding religious association. So as it starts out, they're, they're promising religious freedom. And uh, people who are Protestant think that that's good. People who are Jewish think that that's good. And so a number of supporters are brought into the uh, uh, the Soviet system. There are, are people who are Muslims who think that that's good. They feel like they've been oppressed. Some of these ethnic minorities who are Muslims feel like they've been oppressed. And so they're going to come along and support uh, the Bolsheviks. But by 1929, uh, Stalin is going to implement his law on religious association. Under this, congregations have to be registered. So there's only legal churches. You can't have ones that are not registered. Registered churches will have public meetings, which party members are going to monitor. Churches are going to put, be put under a number of restrictions. Churches are not going to be allowed to make uh, to engage in charitable activities. Prior to this, in the context of the wars, the churches had fed people and uh, cared for people who had been wounded. And uh, now churches were no longer going to be able to engage in uh, organized service and largesse given to poor people because the existence of poor people was something of a denial of the workers' paradise that had supposedly been established here. Uh, you know, that's not needed. Uh, what, if there's excess monies that are there, then the state should decide what should be done with whatever monies are there. So this is also going to take from the church one of its ways of uh, showing that they're Christians is by loving people and serving people in society, particularly people who are in various ways hurting. Another thing that the uh, 
Bolsheviks will insist upon is that the church should no longer engage in educational activities. Education is something that is now taken over by the state. Uh, the state may use church buildings as uh, part of the resources, the infrastructure that's available, but they will have teachers that aren't coming from the clergy. Uh, they're going to have party members who are going to teach the party line and the values of the Bolsheviks in school. So the church is no longer allowed to have church schools. What this is going to do, it's going to drive uh, some expressions of Christianity underground. The state-controlled church will become rather sipid and uh, powerless, but there will be many people who hold on to their faith who will meet illegally uh, in private, uh, breaking the law, and there will be many who will become martyrs for the faith in the process. So worship services will be permitted, but only at the registered churches. And what they're basically doing is cutting off the next generation as children aren't allowed to be indoctrinated through the various catechism services, uh, Sunday schools, uh, and the like. These are all cut off. And church buildings are seen now as being a communal property. So they can be subject to confiscation, uh, used as public schools, or uh, used for other public purposes, maybe as a, a barn to store hay if there's a need to do that, or to score, store wheat if the silos would be full. Not that the weather allows that to happen too terribly often. The clergy, meanwhile, will find themselves under increasing persecution um, and will find that the church will be driven significantly underground. There will also be some people who, when they're able, will try to immigrate. And so there'll be religious refugees uh, that will try to immigrate out of uh, the Bolshevik-dominated territories. This is going to lead to conflict in some of those areas where there are ethnic minorities. So it's not just amongst the Christians, it'll also be amongst the Muslims in all those uh, areas that uh, end with stands and mans. Uh, Kajikistan and Turkmenistan, and all these areas are uh, Russian Soviet socialist republics. And in some of those places, they're going to be more tolerant religiously than others. Uh, but there's an education program and a deliberate program of uh, trying to stamp out Christianity and trying to get people to live for this socialist state. Uh, this is what is truly most important. It's not uh, pleasing God, who they deny exists. It's not... Um, uh, The, the values of uh, uh, the uh, folks in Western Europe who are capitalists, most certainly. So, in Russia, what we find is that under Stalin, uh, there's an ongoing struggle. Uh, the secret police continue to crush opposition. Uh, there are people who rebel against this, and they get relocated. Uh, sent off to work in the the mines are in the cold, frozen areas of Siberia, and people who might be uh, from the cities will be moved to the countryside where they don't particularly know anything about farming. This is not going to be a way that, to uh, achieve the economic targets and the production targets for agriculture. I know it's going to uh, limit uh, this USSR that Stalin has uh, been championing. But he is going to be successful in promoting industrialization. Uh, they're, they're, they're long bread lines sometimes. And people are unhappy. Uh, but he's industrializing Russia, which is going to mean that they're going to have an industrial complex which will be able to build up munitions for what he thinks is the inevitable capitalist invasion. We'll come back to talk about him later in connection with World War II and the deals that he makes prior to the war with Adolf Hitler and Germany. So let's move to think about uh, fasc uh, about uh, totalitarianism in other places. Uh, as we look at it kind of chronologically, we find that uh, a totalitarian regime gets started in Russia earliest. It's going to be picked up then chronologically next in Italy. In Italy, uh, the causes were... Uh, somewhat different, I mean different immediate causes, but certainly there's economic turmoil and hardship, there's um, political 
fragmentation, multiple parties, uh, and the uh, there's also very strong nationalistic identity. And there's still also then the erosion of modern philosophy, where uh, absolute truth is abandoned. Now, many of the people in Italy will continue to be Catholics. Um, and what we're going to find is that the totalitarian regime that emerges in um, Italy under Benito Mussolini uh, will certainly be authoritarian. It's not going to be driven by the same uh, overreaching utopian vision for the world as the Bolsheviks were as they began. But uh, it's going to be centered on nation. Uh, people are frustrated. And as a result, the uh, there's going to be support for the, re the development of Benito Mussolini's black shirts as they come along. Mussolini was a fellow who knew about communications, who had uh, uh, prepared to be a school teacher, became a journalist, and uh, after World War I, things were desperately problematic in uh, Italy, and the economy was in shambles. People were immigrating to various places as they were able. In Italy, under Mussolini, the uh, rise to power came about as a result of the uh, economic situation. Uh, it was one which uh, Victor Emmanuel III, the king of Italy, was in some ways complicit, as in uh, 1922 he will uh, ask uh, Benito Mussolini to serve as the prime minister. Now, what will happen in time is that uh, Mussolini will say that he's answerable to the emperor, but not to the parliament, and he's going to become the veritable dictator, but this is largely with the compliance of King Victor Emmanuel III. Uh, Victor Emmanuel will later try to oust Mussolini, and the Germans will plan to kill him as a result, but um, uh, Victor Emmanuel will have to abdicate after the war because of his support for Mussolini uh, along the way. Mussolini uh, gets the support of Victor Emmanuel, as well as many Italians, because they're afraid of what's going on. They're afraid of anarchy, uh, they're afraid of socialism, and so uh, property people will come to back Mussolini as he seems like he's going to protect uh, certain traditional ways of doing things and uh, certainly he's promising to restore national pride after the uh, uh, failure to gain anything out of the peace treaty at uh, uh, of, uh, following World War I. The um, Italians are doing miserably economically and uh, things are falling apart. Unions are going on strike all the time. And so what Mussolini is going to do is that he's going to uh, increasingly take over the reins of power and create something of a leader cult. Um, this fellow who had once been a, uh, a journalist is going to promote censorship in the press and outlawing political parties. So there's only going to be the fascist party that he's a part of. And um, he's going to outlaw uh, those who would... Uh, right against his party and uh, these uh, rival uh, parties. And as a result, he's able to get some things done. Uh, one of the things will happen is that he'll get trains moving on time. He'll also create employment through uh, employing people to do such things as excavating the site at Pompeii in Herculaneum, where he creates work as he's going to take over the economy. So there's a lot that's... Uh, going to commend him to people, but in the process he's going to take away their freedoms. Uh, he doesn't have a uh, agenda that is going to uh, put aside the church, and so as a result we're going to find that Pope Pius XI, who is an ardent anti-communist conservative, will, uh, under the Lateran agreements of 1929, make peace with, uh, with Mussolini, and Catholicism will become the state religion there in Italy. So a number of achievements there. He's able to bring stability back to uh, a situation that was falling apart. And um, subsequently, though, he will ally, he inspires Adolf Hitler to some degree. And later on, he'll ally with um, the Germans and uh, their agenda. And uh, as a result, he'll eventually come down. 
Moving to Germany. In Germany, we see the rise of a racist type of totalitarianism espoused by Adolf Hitler in Nazism. Uh, the name Nazi comes out of a, uh, a political party that Hitler would come to be a leader of, the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Um, while it has nationalist in its name, that's the, the major character. As far as socialist goes, they're ardent anti-communist. And... Um, it's a, a German nationalist party uh, that seeks to um, restore national pride after the humiliation of the, the uh, uh, treaty at Versailles where Germany's taken the, the blame for the war and Germany's paying a price for the war and economically things are uh, falling into disarray. The origins of the Nazi party then come in the aftermath of World War I, the economic hardships that exist in Germany, as the, there's huge inflation and uh, the political turmoil, as there's many political parties and uh, instability, where people are psychologically looking for uh, someone to come and save them. Uh, philosophically, some of their traditional roots have been cut off, and uh, into this situation will rise Adolf Hitler. A veteran from World War I who had uh, received some uh, medals for his valor and had uh, uh, suffered from a gas attack along the way. But in the aftermath of the, uh, uh, the, the war, he, like many German veterans, uh, didn't have anything particularly to do. There's lots of complaining in the beer halls of uh, Germany, uh, wondering how uh, they, they lost the war particularly given all the propaganda that had been going on, like leading them to believe they were in such a powerful position. And so people are going to be very unhappy politically. There's great instability. Uh, the communists are gaining power in Germany, and some traditionalists are going to resist that. Hitler was part of an attempt to take over the government, to put one of the generals in power, and uh, uh, that so-called beer hall putsch that re re revolt was put down, and uh, in the years that follow, uh, he would be in prison for a short while as a political prisoner, and during that time he would write a uh, book entitled Mein Kampf. It means my struggle. We talked about Culture Kampf before, the cultural struggle that Bismarck had engaged in, but in Mein Kampf we have a program shift, an outline of uh, those things which lie ahead. It basically outlines what Hitler is going to do in the future as he sees the uh, noble Germanic people as being cramped within the land and needing Liebenschram, living space, in which to fulfill their destiny to be the master race. He blames the uh, circumstances and uh, the, the social changes uh, partially upon the Jews. Uh, he sees the new art as being Jewish art. Um, he sees that uh, there are Jews who are in the new government, the so-called Weimar Republic. This is where their capital is at. And uh, in response, he's very much against that. And uh, like Mussolini, he'll develop uh, some paramilitary types who are going to band together and drive ahead the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Through the years, uh, he will not win elections. This is a minor party, but things just, like in Italy, are very fragmented. The political situation is uh, in shambles. And so eventually, President von Hindenburg asks Hitler to try to form a government. And as he takes power, he's going to take uh, the situations that come his way uh, in order to build his power and... Uh, the Germans, as a people that are interested in their nation, are going to, in time, in 1934, vote in a plebiscite giving Hitler power. He will become the leader of the nation, the Fuhrer. One of the problems that comes along is that there's going to be a fire in the Reichstag, and this is seen to be perpetrated by a Jewish uh, communist, a uh, fellow by the name of von Lübe, and von Lübe um, is blamed for burning the equivalent of what would be uh, our Congress. And uh, as a result, Hitler's going to gain uh, 
support for his ideas that uh, this country, which is under oppression because of the war treaties that had been made, uh, needs to break out from those things. And so he's going to uh, stop paying payments to um, the debtors and uh, there'll be some agreement that given the economic hardships of the Great Depression, that that's a reasonable sort of thing to do as their banks collapse and their money becomes uh, worthless. Uh, there's a great deal of insecurity and people look towards Hitler as a strong man to give them security. So once he comes to power, he's going to uh, push through the Enabling Act, which is going to give him uh, the powers that he needs. And he's going to suspend certain uh, freedoms for a period of time and in order to regain control of society. And he gets support for doing that. He's going to build something of a leader cult. And as he puts his people in positions of power, he's going to work to subvert various institutions. And as a result, Jews will be pushed out of those institutions and enemies of his ideology are going to be pushed out of these institutions. He's going to create a loyalty cult here behind the leader. And he's going to work to promote an Aryan state. So he's going to remove people from office whose uh, ethnicity is brought into question. The Jews in particular are going to be oppressed. And under these uh, new laws, they'll be purged from positions of prominence. Their professorships and in institutions will be withdrawn. And uh, positions of uh, local government will be withdrawn. And he'll promote boycotts against Jewish businesses and uh, uh, the installation of the Nuremberg Laws, whereby Jews are going to have to start carrying uh, IDs and being identified. And there's laws against intermarriage. And the situation is getting worse and worse for Jews in Germany. Now, there have been a great deal of anti-Semitic feeling in Germany for years prior to this. And many of the young people who have the ability to move are going to be moving out of Germany. Older people and people who have uh, people who are poor uh, and don't have a means to leave, or people who are so invested in properties in Germany they can't leave, are going to stay behind, and they're going to largely be the ones who are going to be falling victim uh, to the uh, the political and social developments that Hitler is going to push in Germany. Another item of domestic policy that he's going to pursue is repudiating the treaty at Versailles, refusing to pay, uh, make war reparations, and uh, uh, going ahead and constructing military equipment, putting uh, more men in arms. Uh, this is one of the ways he's helping the economy, is that he's uh, recruiting people into the military, and this is a way that he helps with the unemployment problem. Uh, he's going to have them building infrastructure that will help them when they do want to go to war. Whether it's the autobahns, the highways, uh, the railway systems are pretty well developed already, but that will be enlarged upon. Uh, building bridges and highways are ways to put people to work and uh, build loyalty to this new uh, nation that's, that's growing ahead. Uh, the, the, there will be a number of provocations that Hitler will engage in, and each time he's going to find that he can keep pushing because nobody wants to go back to war. They're still suffering from the losses from World War I, and nobody wants to go to war. But as he moves from the economic areas and areas where internally he's, he's starting to build ships beyond the quotas that he was allowed to build, uh, have larger armies than what he's allowed to have, uh, retaking the area of the Ruhr, this industrially important area from France. Uh, people don't want to go to war over those things. Okay, that was German territory. Let it be. But he then wants to expand in his policies, in his foreign policy, uh, to engage in what's known as the Anschluss. This would be the reincorporation of ethnic Germanies within a single Germany. Prior to this, we've had German-speaking peoples who are in this German empire uh, that's led by the Kaiser. And then, uh, at least up to World War One, and then we've had this um, the uh, Empire of the Austrians, and the western part of Austria is German speaking. And uh, what he wants to do is to see Austrians uh, join together with Germany and 
German minorities that are in other countries drawn together into a singular, a singular nation where they can fulfill their destiny as the master race. The problem is that sometimes there are minorities in those other countries. Now, Hitler himself was Austrian as far as his birth, and he's come to identify with Germany. And we're going to find that uh, this Anschluss will be something that will reincorporate a number of different countries. One of the first countries, of course, will come on will be the Austrians. Uh, the Austrians have lost a great deal of their empire as a result of World War I, and um, they're stinging from that. They're suffering the same problems otherwise. And it's in this context, for some of you who might have watched The Sound of Music sometime, you have the Nazis taking over Austria. Uh, Austria is one without a shot. Um, the Austrian people are going to vote to join with Germany. And so the Nazis will come to power and their their ideology will come to be the norm in uh, in Austria. It's in that context, if you watch The Sound of Music, the Von Trapp family is going to leave. You'll recognize he was uh, a captain in the Austrian Navy, but after World War One, the Austrians don't have a navy. They don't have uh, great ports that can, they can have access to any longer in the Adriatic or on the Black Sea. So... Uh, He's still a captain in the Austrian Navy, but uh, he and his family are going to flee to neutral Switzerland. Other areas where there are Germanic-speaking peoples would be in the territory of Yugos in Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia was a country that had been carved out of uh, the Austrian Empire, and the western part of Czechoslovakia was uh, the Czech Republic, where people speak German. Uh, at least a large portion of them speak German. And uh, particularly there's a portion of this known as the Sudetenland. So you have a couple million ethnic Germans who are un in a, uh, another new state that they're a minority within. So he wants to bring these people from, from the Sudetenland back into Germany. He also aspires to take territory from Poland where there were ethnic Germans that were under Polish domination and reincorporate them. So these are all these pockets of German people, uh, German ethnically and German culturally, uh, that he wants to reincorporate. And as he reincorporates uh, the Sudetenland, uh, the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain would say, we've maintained peace in our time. Uh, as a result of the Munich Conference, uh, they'll capitulate here. Uh, they won't go to war. They don't want to go to war. And uh, as a result, Hitler is able to find that he can keep pressing his advantage and his uh, image of invincibility and success back at home just continues to grow. He's not going to be content with that, however. As you go back to his uh, Mein Kampf, what you find is that he's looking for Liebenschram, uh, empire in, a sen in essence, uh, but m most of the territories have uh, been claimed, and so what he aspires to do is to take over territory from Untermenschen, from subhumans like Slavic peoples. Uh, these, these and Jews, he seems as being less, sees as being less than human. And so this is his policy that he's going to pursue until the war is going to break out. Now in the area of the, uh, of Germany, it's interesting to look at the Christian response to the Weimar Republic. Certainly within this new liberal republic that begins after World War I, uh, we find that conservative, li l conservative, conservative Lutherans didn't like the new separation of church and state. They didn't have the privileges that they had before. And uh, uh, so this will be something they resent. Uh, they'll have some uh, sympathy with the anti-republican right as a result. And certainly they'll have a number of social concerns regarding morality. Uh, the uh, the Christians recognize that there's problems and will find that uh, there will be some that are going to resist the uh, growth of Nazism and people that will become martyrs for that cause. There are many Christians, however, who are co-opted by the Nazis uh, because of their support for anti-communism. Uh, we'll see particularly that the Catholics are going to be co-opted uh, through a treaty that the Nazis will make with uh, the Vatican. And Hitler will put on the pretense of going to church at times, and he's going to call for positive cre Christianity. 
And so uh, German Christians are going to be put under a Reichsbishop, a uh, bishop of the country, a uh, Ludwig Müller. And uh, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the church, if you're going to maintain positions in the church, you're supposed to be able to uh, accept the so-called Aryan paragraph. And within the church, people who came from Jewish backgrounds would be uh, dismissed from their position of power. The, uh, there is some resistance. People like Martin Niemuller in the Confessing Church, or uh, we'll find Karl Barth in the um, Barman Declaration of 1934. There are people that are waving flags, concerned about what's going on here, and there are people who will engage in... Uh, uh, resistance to this, people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who are going to engage in opposition to this uh, uh, growth in uh, power that's being uh, asserted by Hitler. But nationally, he seemed to be a success. He's uh, building up infrastructure, putting people to work, um, and he uses all the different sorts of media that are at his disposal in his campaigns. Even if you look back at his Mein Kampf, you'll find that he's uh, out to use mass media and propaganda, and he's going to do that very effectively. He'll particularly have the help of Leni, Leni Riefenstahl, um, a very famous uh, documentary uh, maker from Africa in recent decades. Uh, but uh, she pioneers a lot of cinematography, uh, things that you've come to be just taking for granted as, as you watch the evening news you have the person who's reading the news to you who looks you in the face and then turns and looks into a second camera uh, she's going to uh, use multiple uh, cameras that she'll splice footage together on and it pre creates a uh, uh, something attractive to the person's brain as they as these camera angles change and it's it's very very effective uh, she has a very adamant subject. Hitler is a uh, very enthusiastic orator and uh, who demonstrates great conviction, uh, even if the logic's not always there. Uh, he's going to be creating a sense of German pride after uh, these people have felt so humiliated after the war. So he's going to build uh, support there and that support base will be such that he's going to build up military capacities and will go to war uh, to extend his purposes of gaining uh, the Anschluss, the reincorporation of ethnic Germans, and Liebenschram. We'll talk about the progress of that war here in uh, a subsequent lecture. The um, growth of governmental power is not limited only to um, Germany or Italy or Russia. We'll find that in response to uh, political hard times and economic hard times that authority is asserted in a number of other places. In the United States we'll find that uh, in the aftermath of the war there's initially great prosperity but by the time we come to 1929 uh, there is a uh, Great Depression that strikes, and in response to that, we'll find that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt will uh, get the government involved in central planning of the economy and uh, borrowing money to put people to work on various tasks, uh, tasks like building up roads and uh, working in national parks and Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration um, trying to keep there from being a revolution. So the government gets involved in economics like it never has previously and uh, is trying to put people to work. Uh, the United States never suffers the unemployment rates that Europe had long suffered. But uh, nonetheless, there are people who are looking for changes and uh, with the Republican presidents, they didn't see that as coming along, so they vote in Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who's going to use uh, means of mass communication to portray a sense of calm in his fireside chats, 
and um, he's going to work to get people employed uh, this is going to come with some opposition however as he uh, has problems with the Congress and with the Supreme Court he's going to uh, use his uh, position of power uh, to act in ways which presidents hadn't traditionally acted and uh, is going to limit freedoms at times uh, where we're, we're going to find that strikes will be suppressed uh, that there'll be censorship of the press there'll be concern over communism so there'll be anti-communist uh, rhetoric that's uh, promoted and uh, so there's a temptation in response to crisis sometimes uh, and uh, in the United States we'll see that uh, there's not a uh, an ideology that drives things there's a, a national identity that will continue to keep the uh, the Union together but uh, these are very very difficult times and uh, not everybody likes the way that things are changing. Some people are looking to go back to change things back to the way that they were before. And so you'll find that there, there's some conservatives in the United States who want to turn back the clock. Uh, they didn't like how things were changing and thought that society was falling apart. And so there are people who are willing to embrace those ideologies in the United States. We'll see that... Uh, uh, the Communist Party will become a political party in the United States. It never gains uh, significant uh, percentages of uh, the electorate, but uh, it is providing a different vision for how the United States might organize. So in the aftermath of World War I, uh, we have some things that happen that long shaped the world, as we have governments becoming much, much more involved in uh, economics and politics as we have Roosevelt embracing Keynesian economics uh, we have governments controlling the press uh, using the media to uh, shape uh, the way that people think using education to shape the way that people think um, and we have the various ideologies that emerge we'll find that uh, Authoritarian regimes will continue to the present time. Uh, some of them will also be totalitarian, where they'll be guided by ideologies uh, that are intolerant, and uh, people who don't embrace it are going to be persecuted. It's not just that you go along and you comply. You've got to be a true believer, otherwise you're an enemy of the revolution uh, and uh, worthy of being uh, punished. Well... It's certainly an interesting time that is going to greatly affect the world in the years to come. And we'll begin next time by talking about World War II uh, and uh, see how it shapes the world. So be thinking how these uh, totalitarian regimes have shaped the world, shaped Western civilization, and how these ideologies have legs that take them places.